the mid-1970s, the Stones were in trouble. Having lost their inspiration, their relevance and their lead guitarist, they bravely changed their sound and recruited Ronnie Wood, who galvanized the band. Ronnie is sort of like a glue that holds this band together. He came there with an energy that they needed that nobody else provided. His personality imbues the Stones with a vitality that they had been missing for a long time, even though the rest of the world may not know it. Mick and Keith know it. As the decade progressed, the band adapted to new trends, incorporating funk, disco, and punk into their sound. And as guitarist Keith Richards was deteriorating, it was up to Mick Jagger to lead the Stones into uncharted territory. The period from 76 through to the mid 80s, Jagger is really at the helm. Keith was out there, crashed out under the sofa quite a lot of the time, and he really had his work cut out. When the Stones had their backs against the wall, there's that element of sort of fight there. But by the dawn of the 1980s, the creative partnership that had made the Stones so influential was mutating, and a feud between Jagger and Richards threatened to tear the band apart. You've got to have one guy who's extrovert and ambitious and together and controlling and all those things. And then the flip side of that, or the yang to that yin, or however you want to put it, is the more saturnine, darker figure, the creative animus of the thing. But I think at a certain point, those poles become more starkly defined. You know, in other words, you know, Mick becomes more controlling and more ambitious, and Keith becomes more sort of set in his way. This programme looks at the Stones' output from 1975 to 1983, a troubled time in which, despite the internal conflicts and the continued struggle to remain relevant, the band still managed to produce enduring work. If you listen to these records today, yes, they are patchy, but there are the last moments of Rolling Stone's majesty and greatness in these records. In the late 1960s and early 70s, the Rolling Stones were at the height of their powers. Where the death of their founding member Brian Jones in 1969 may have broken a lesser band, the Stones instead discovered a greater drive and focus in his absence, and with a string of remarkable albums, ascended to the very top of popular music. With the Beatles gone, Dylan treading water, and American figureheads Jimi Hendrix and Jim Morrison succumbing to the same excesses that had taken Jones, by 1972's Exile on Main Street, the Stones were left seemingly unchallenged as the world's greatest rock and roll band. Yet over the next two years, their fortunes changed, and the albums Goat's Head Soup and It's Only Rock and Roll were met with a more muted response from fans and critics, while a new wave of young musicians spearheaded by David Bowie began to make their presence felt in the UK, the Stones seemed to be losing their grip. Right around the time of Goat's Head Soup and It's Only Rock and Roll, you really began to wonder about, you know, what was the meaning of the Rolling Stones at this point? Now, that was happening with rock and roll in general, by the way. You know, there was a, I mean, you know, I've interviewed Bruce Springsteen about this, and it was around the time he was coming out. And as he said, he goes, you know, at the time that people were referring to me as the new Dylan, the old Dylan was 33. Just being past 30 raised questions about your relevance as a rock star and your ability to be part of this rock and roll world. And everybody was feeling that. <laughs> The Rolling Stones, I mean, they had just come off, you know, a run of records that, I, I mean, is as strong as anything anyone has ever done in, in rock and roll. But everybody was trying to find their way in the 70s, and Goat's Head Soup and uh, It's Only Rock and Roll are records, I think, that suggest, you know, the Rolling Stones responding to things rather than driving them. There are good songs on both Goat's Head Soup and It's Only Rock and Roll, but, you know, you can't really make a strong argument for them as, you know, major stone statements. The 
It's Only Rock and Roll did not produce a top 10 single in America, which was the first time that it happened since their Satanic Majesty's request. Well, that you can understand because the Stones just did not cope with 1967. They were not a peace and love group. But in 1974, you would have thought they should have been able to come up with something, but nothing off of that album was a hit. And it actually looked like they were winding down. Internally, the band were also struggling. With Mick Jagger and his wife Bianca stepping out into high society, the frontman's dedication to music seemed to be waning, and Keith Richards' worsening heroin addiction was leading to a very visible deterioration. By the end of 1974, just before the Stones intended to return to the studio to begin work on a new album, Brian Jones' replacement, Mick Taylor, announced that he was leaving the group. Although many felt he had never seemed comfortable as part of the ensemble, the departure came as a shock to his other bandmates. When Mick Taylor announced his departure, I mean, Jagger said he was very, very disappointed by it. I think it really shocked the band. Uh, within a few weeks, Jagger was saying, actually, Keith Richards is the sound of the Stones. Mick Taylor wasn't really a stone at all. But uh, and in a way, at the time, we undervalued him, I think. But listening back, he contributed so much. And he saw the Stones through that period with his very elegant, virtuoso playing which I think was crucial at that time when everyone was looking towards you know, progressive rock and rock being almost on a classical status. <laughs> Mick Taylor contributed so much from the guitar meshing from Honky Tonk Women. Sticky Fingers, I think he vaguely co-wrote Sway. Um, he's all over Exile. Ventilator Blues, he got a co-credit. Um, and then right, even, it's only rock and roll, when you felt that he was being nudged out a little bit, he does this wonderful Carlos Santana-style guitar solo on Time Waits for No One. So his contributions, I think, were immense um, in that way, and we almost didn't realise until he'd gone, you know, what he weaved into the fabric of the Stones. Despite the setback, the band pressed on and immediately began looking for another guitarist. One figure in particular stood out as a potential new recruit. Ron Wood, formerly of the Jeff Beck Group and then a member of The Faces, had become close friends with Keith Richards. In early 74, he had both contributed to the title track of It's Only Rock and Roll and enlisted Richards, Jagger and Mick Taylor to contribute to his own solo LP, I've Got My Own Album To Do. As the Stones went into the studio in December to begin sessions for Black and Blue, Wood seemed the natural choice to join them. Just as the faces were a kind of version of the Stones, a sort of more laddish and less sort of decadent, you know, more, more boozy, laddish version of the Stones, so Ronnie was keys to Rod Stewart's Mick Jagger. I mean, that's very clear that they were a sort of Xerox of the Stones in many ways. And so people knew Ronnie in that way, that he was like this kind of... You know, he was like one of the crows out of uh, the Jungle Book with a kind of fag sticking out of his mouth and, you know, the, the sort of rugrats hair. And, you know, so Ronnie was a bit of a cartoon, I think, you know, uh, more than anything else. You know, you didn't revere him as a riff maestro or rhythm guitarist in the way that Keith was. <laughs> Ronnie Wood was that he felt instinctively as if he was a Rolling Stone even before he was in the faces I think I remember his brother Art Wood I interviewed him once and he said that was he, Ronnie always felt that was his destiny and also he was Keith Richards playmate which was the polar opposite of what Mick Taylor was they were very very different both in, in the way they played and in their social lives as well Ronnie and Keith mid 73 I think they were living together or you know Keith lived at the bottom of the wick Ronnie was a little bit at a loose end in the faces because Rod had this 
solo career that was going along at the same time, so no one in the faces quite knew what, they were, you know, what their status was, really. And Ronnie came up with his solo album in 74, which Keith and Mick both contributed. Keith actually contributed two great songs, Act Together and Saw The One You Need, to that, and Keith actually played at the, at the gig. So Ronnie did have a, have a profile, certainly a higher profile than some of the other guitarists that were mentioned, you know. Um, there was even talk of Alexis Corner, Harvey Mandel, Wayne Perkins, Yorma Kalkinen from Jefferson Airplane. I mean, that would have been incredible, but very, very unlikely. Um, Ronnie was the gu second guitarist in waiting. He really felt that even when he was in the faces. Throughout the early months of 1975, the Stones invited three of the guitarists on the shortlist to the sessions for Black and Blue. Along with Wood, the American guitarists Wayne Perkins and Harvey Mandel also recorded contributions. Yet with the first official compilation of their Atlantic Records contract, Made in the Shade, ready for release, the band put the new album on hold and planned a major American tour with Ronnie Wood brought on board as the live guitarist. Despite seeing their crown slip with the previous two albums, when the band announced this new tour by performing on a truck down Fifth Avenue in New York, the reception proved that the Stones had lost none of their appeal. You know, you can look at the records that they put out in the 70s, but at least in the States, there's something else that you have to bear in mind. Every three years between 72 and 81, the Stones toured, and every time they toured, it was a very big deal. The biggest deal in rock and roll. Bigger than Rolling Thunder, bigger than Led Zeppelin, bigger than anything. The Stones were not diminished at that time, as I ever understood it. That happened in the 80s, not in the 70s. They were a real presence in American rock. They were the world's greatest rock and roll band. Even if they were the world's greatest rock and roll band, the times were changing, and the Stones were ready to incorporate new elements into their sound. In 1975, funk was emerging, with George Clinton's Parliament and Funkadelic bands, Cool and the Gang and Sly and the Family Stone all achieving mainstream chart success. As ever, it was Jagger who had his antenna out for new musical trends. For the live shows, he invited Billy Preston, who had joined them on their 1973 tour, to participate in their performances in a far more prominent capacity, while bringing on board ex-Stevie Wonder percussionist Ollie Brown to add to the rhythms and make them more fresh. Jagger, particularly, I think, was always on the lookout for, for what's happening contemporary-wise. You know, Keith might have his heart back in Robert Johnson days or chess, but Mick is there listening to what's going on now and what will be going on next year. So I think he was always very aware of trends. Funk, I mean, well, he took his dancing from James Brown, the like godfather of it, but um, they were always aware of Stevie Wonder. They did, I don't know why, they covered that um, Stevie Wonder song. Billy Preston was with them from 72, Goat Said Soup. And you can hear on 100 Years Ago this, the funk element creeping in there. So by 75, it made sense. It brought a new kind of energy to the live performance as well, I think, just so it wasn't just a, a rock sound. And they were playing America, that tour was America, where funk was bigger. <laughs> And Jagger again, his keen eye for David Bowie and what Bowie, there was this amazing rivalry that people forget, I think. Bowie changing course on every album, changing his musical course, changing his image course. I think Jagger looked at that and thought, that's what I should have been doing. <laughs> Bowie was starting to embrace his plastic soul and Jagger didn't want to be left behind with that. So it did make sense to bring Ollie Brown and Billy on board. Oh, 
That sense of having Billy Preston on stage, you know, a guy whose roots go back to gospel, go back to Little Richard, go back to all of that core stuff that the Stones always wanted to emulate. Well, Billy Preston lived it, you know, when as a, as a teenager. You know, the guy's a first-rate player, a great songwriter, a fantastic singer, a showman, you know, and I think, you know, Mick kind of latched on to him. got a couple of solo numbers and you know that's not <laughs> that's not very difficult the Rolling Stones are not particularly generous that way but I think Billy Preston got that partly because of who he was and you know just how good he is but also partly because he served a certain function within the Stones emotional dynamic you know I think the 1975 tour for the Rolling Stones was not a high point and I think having Billy Preston along just kind of kept everybody's spirits up, you know, beyond what he added musically. Yet for many, these additional musicians were simply window dressing, a smokescreen to deflect from the Stones' own lackluster performances. And despite record attendances, for the first time in the band's career, the press widely criticized the shows. I think you could feel Jagger being a little bored with the Rolling Stones live, and there was an element of kind of self-parody, really. Uh, in, in particularly with Jagger. And the band, I, I think, was a, a little monochromatic. So it was uh, discouraging because obviously you wanted them to be great and uh, they had always been great. You know, that famous announcement, you know, the greatest rock and roll band in the world, that was about live performance. That wasn't, you know, they made the greatest records, they're the greatest songwriters, you know, anybody can you know, make that argument, but the greatest rock and roll band in the world, that was about the Stones on stage and the Stones on stage were getting to be a little tired during this period. The one thing the tour did manage to achieve was to put an end to the Stones' search for a guitarist. Having road-tested Ronnie, the band felt that they need look no further for Mick Taylor's replacement. When Rod Stewart announced that he was breaking up the faces to fully embark on a solo career in December 1975, the group formally offered Wood a permanent position as a Rolling Stone. I mean, when Ronnie walked in the room, just played by numbers, eh? it's, it's obvious, everybody else yeah, was up for the gig. Agreed, you gotta, you know, so it was, uh, there we are, lumbered with him, still are. I think it was a perfectly good decision for them to make. I don't, you know, Harvey Mandel, what would that have meant? Nothing. Would mean something. Woody means something. He commits them to that kind of scruffy thing they started out with. Uh, and given who the rest of the guys are, especially Jagger, I think that's a good thing. Were you a bit overawed when you joined the Stones? Well, there's no reason you should be overawed. Was it difficult to join? Yeah, I was overawed awesome. because I always wanted to be in that band from college, and I said, well, I'm going to be in that band. Really? Yeah. And I just happened to make myself in the right place at the right time. Is the experience of a big band like the Stones, is that very different from, say, the Faces, or was it just a, a, another, dig, another shift of gear up? Well, the, the Stones are very much more well-organized uh, working unit you know it's a fantastically well-organized unit whereas the faces was um, very um, odd bins sponsored uh, you know very uh, um, party very party really. yeah I think Ronnie was a safe choice for the stones really Ronnie was a party animal Ronnie was a good time chap who was going to just look right on stage in some way. I mean, I, 
still think it was a really disappointing choice, you know, and I think it just said everything about the Stones mm, kind of laziness that they just thought, oh, well, you know, Ronnie, we'll just, we'll just have Ronnie in, you know. Whereas, obviously, Mick Taylor had, had provided such an interesting counterpoint, such a melodic counterpoint to, to Keith. Ronnie just didn't, I can, to this day, I couldn't tell you what Ronnie is really doing in the Stones. You know, even when I know that he's the primary guitarist on, on, on a track, he just seems to me an utterly kind of indistinguishable guitarist with no real style of his own at all. of Ron Wood in the band was kind of Keith asserting himself and making that decision. Now, Mick Jagger always got along with Ron Wood and I think finally, uh, you know, certainly went along with it. And, you know, uh, and I think ultimately, you know, Ron Wood found ways to really be an interesting guitarist in the Rolling Stones. But I feel like, you know, it was like Keith's buddy, you know, getting into the band. Obviously, he's like Keith's little brother, emulates Keith, looks like Keith, acts like Keith to a degree, plays like Keith. And, you know, I think Keith needed that. I don't think Mick Taylor, as fantastic as his playing was, you know, ever really fully settled into, Ro into the Rolling Stones. I mean, there was too much turmoil. I don't think he ever figured out a way to, to sort that out. Whereas, you know, Ron Wood was just kind of an easygoing guy. I mean, along with everything else, and you kind of had to be. You know, if you didn't have the right personality, that was as important as your playing. Wood's musical contribution to the Stones could finally be heard on record in April 76, when the album Black and Blue was released. Continuing the band's run of US number one LPs and hitting number two in the UK, it demonstrated the Stones had lost little of their commercial appeal. Yet outside of the top ten ballad Fool to Cry, the album was light on anthems or potential hits, and saw the band experimenting with both musical forms and three guitarists. Critical and public reaction was polarised. Black and Blue is an interesting record. I think it was Ron Wood who said, you know, it's very characteristic of Mick that he would manage, you know, in his kind of canny way to make the process of recruiting guitarists also be the recording of an album. And, you know, so uh, you get like, you know, Harvey Mandel and you get, uh, you know, Wayne Perkins and you get Ron Wood and you get Black and Blue also. It is a work in progress album, really. <laughs> but the work in progress is not the album, it's the group. But give me the choice of listening to Black and Blue and it's only rock and roll, and eight times out of 10, I'll take Black and Blue. I had a sense with it's only rock and roll of decline. Uh, at least with, with Black and Blue, I had a sense of either marking time or in a couple of tracks, oh, these are okay. Well, I come home, baby. I've been working all night long But put my daughter on my knee And she said Daddy, what's wrong? She whispered in my ear so sweet You know what she said, she said It definitely seemed that Fool to Cry had effort behind it. And that becomes an important concept because with many albums uh, after Exile on Main Street, one doubts Mick Jagger's fundamental commitment to songwriting. Fool 
to cry is one of those Rolling Stones Marmite tracks that you love it or you hate it. For me, it's, it's, it's a great haunting ballad and uh, terrific vocal performance by, by Jagger. The idea that Jagger uh, was going through the motions at this stage, I think is, is quite misguided. I mean, there are lots of other things going on in his life as well, and arguably uh, his band is no longer the most important thing in his life, but it's still incredibly important to him. And, uh, you know, he... I think he, he was aghast at the idea that the Stones could put out a deliberately substandard record. So this suggestion that, that he somehow wasn't trying or, or, you know, was operating on autopilot, I don't buy at all. And on a, a song like Fool to Cry, you know, I mean, he... It's really quite an affecting song, you know, and he sounds vulnerable and uh, he, he sounds to me like someone who cares and cares a lot. That Jagger and the band cared was most evident on the album's notable opening track, Hot Stuff. If the presence of Billy Preston and Ollie Brown on the 1975 tour had suggested the influence of funk on the Stones' music, with this song they boldly broke from the formula and leapt into this flourishing genre. You know, on Black and Blue, if you take the track Hot Stuff, you know, Harvey Mandel playing guitar on that, you know, kind of a funk riff, you know, Jagger doing his reggae thing at the end. And there's, uh, you know, the beginning of this kind of New York obsession that's starting to work with the Rolling Stones, you know. You know, all you people in New York City, I know you're all going broke, but I know you're tough, you know. I found that a really a, a kind of compelling track. I mean, I liked it. I think Hot Stuff was a remarkable track. As soon as the needle went down, you're like, my God, what's this? What have the Stones done? They've really broken out, broken from type, uh, especially after the disappointing previous album. So, and I think it worked amazingly well. You had the Wayne Perk, uh, Harvey Mandel, who was playing the, you know, Isley Brothers style guitar, uh, lead, fluid lead guitar over Bill's bubbling, wonderful bass line. Um, and I think it's, you know, it was almost like the rock band's version of Superstition or something, that, that energy that it had. So it was a, you know, I think it set the tone for Black and Blue as well. That was it, this, it, a real positive, positive step. <laughs> I really like that record, and I really like that record because at the time, I thought, this is a good idea. I'm really glad they're doing this. This took some guts. I don't think disco sucks. And although this is clearly was not a disco record, uh, it was a rhythm record. This is not a songwriter record. There are not great songs on this record. But there is something else really rather courageous going on. Now, I know Mick now dismisses all this, and maybe... It was a last resort for him, I don't know. But formally, they took a chance, especially Hey Negrita and Melody, which is mostly Billy Preston playing both piano and organ. And rhythmically, these are very, very strong, interesting tracks. Finally, you know, Charlie Watts is the ideal rock drummer. He's not a funk drummer. So he isn't really, and, and Bill, Bill is hanging in there. <laughs> uh, 
That's all. He's not Bootsy Collins either. Um, so that it has a certain kind of, there's a kind of drag to the groove. It, it, there is still very much some 4-4 feeling and spirit in it, even if they're trying to not quite do that. But it doesn't matter. Everything else is just clicking. The rhythms are really, really interesting. And you can just listen to them interplay on both those tracks. I find, find them inexhaustible. Here's one last dollar. And then we go. thought Black and Blue at the time and still now as a great Stones record. In fact, probably their best 70s record after Exile and Sticky Fingers. Um, John Peel, actually, at the time, played it in its entirety, and he said this is quite probably the best Stones album ever, which people forget. Um, it, it was dealt harshly by the critics, I think, at the time. When the Stones had their backs against the wall, you know, they didn't have a guitarist, it was just four of them, there's that element of sort of fight there. And I think time has borne out that it actually is a pretty successful record. Black and Blue was not without controversy, however. A billboard poster advertising the album in Los Angeles inflamed certain groups, featuring a bound and bruised woman under the quote, I'm black and blue from the Rolling Stones, and I love it. The ad secured the band valuable publicity. Yet in a decade when attitudes and sensibilities were changing, it also made the Rolling Stones seem outdated. The infamous ads for Black and Blue, you know, uh, uh, the woman, whatever her name was, on the Sunset Strip billboard, you know, and I liked it or whatever. I mean, I, for me, it's less about sort of shock tactics and outraging the feminist movement. It really does show how out of touch they were, you know, how, how much they were part of the problem, really. I mean, there was a certain level of English rock musician that just sort of epitomised some kind of misogyny, sexism, just so sort of unenlightened, so out of touch with any idea that women could be equals. I mean, that's the world they lived in. They just lived in a world where a woman was you know, was either a kind of slut or a groupie or a, or a six foot two Texan model on your arm or just, just, you know, arm candy, just not, no real kind of idea that, that women deserved respect. And that billboard just, to me, is so egregious. It just, it goes way beyond, I mean, it's just absolutely inexcusable. And the band's continued struggle to keep up with the times was brought into sharp focus when they returned to the UK to promote the album in May. Where their use of funk rhythms may have seemed current to American audiences, in England a musical revolution was in progress and a new scene was emerging that was actively disassociating itself from the bloated excesses of millionaire rock stars. was looking to rebuild popular music, and it wanted nothing to do with the Stones. The stage props that had worked to entertain the masses on their US tour in 1975, including a giant inflatable penis and Jagger swinging on a trapeze above the audience, would be viewed back in their homeland as laughable examples of how ridiculous this once vital act had become. How did someone as smart as Mick Jagger say, oh yeah, sure, that's a great idea, we'll have a big blow-up penis on stage, you know, it, it just is something that so easily lends itself to parody and is so unnecessary. You know, it was part of what was happening in rock and roll is, you know, the halls got bigger and bigger and the audiences, you know, got kind of less and less connected to the band. You know, by the time you're in arenas and certainly in stadiums, you know, it's not your necessarily only your truest, deepest, you know, most ardent fans who are there. It's kind of everybody who's looking for something to do on Thursday night is there. And you have to, and you know, I think you could feel like you have to entertain them, uh, not just with your music. And that's where the inflatable penis comes in, and it's a big problem. I remember uh, being in Earl's Court for the uh, giant inflatable penis, 
And I just thought, oh, he, he. I mean, it was just one of those things where you, you did want to hide your head in your hands. Um, and it shot out confetti and the whole th and the, the whole thing. I mean, nothing left to the imagination here. And you thought, why? For those people who were not loyal to the Stones to begin with, this was alienating. So they were not the role models anymore. It's quite amazing how punk comes along. And even though you would have thought these guys are, are rebels. The Stones in the late 60s were rebels. There's got to be some affinity here. There was no reference. There was no backwards reference. I saw them in 76, and I went with my sister. As we were going to Earl's Court, we bumped into some punks, and it was a very, very early days of punks. They've been in the press for a couple of months or so. Years later, I interviewed Captain Sensible, and I also did a book on Sid Vicious, and I found out that they were at Earl's Court. Captain remembers it, and when I did the Vicious start, and Vicious was there as well. They'd gone to laugh at the old hippies who were going to see the Stones. Having, you know, Jagger swinging from a rope, I think at one point he said, oh, it's the best part of the show, that is, swinging off this rope, you know, and, and he, on this giant penis and um, the lotus-shaped stage, and which he designed with Peter Rudge. I mean, Jagger saw himself as an art director, you know, he, by this time he was the head of a corporation and films, and, you know, it wanted more than just rock. Rock wasn't really enough for him. But for a disaffected young generation who'd come through and seen the Wild Bolan and Bowie, they wanted something different from their rock stars, I think, and the Stones just didn't speak to that uh, generation at all. As punk grew into a major musical and cultural phenomenon, in the UK, the only Stone to escape with his reputation intact was Keith Richards. Where the stage props and the superficiality were seen to stem from Jagger, Richards remained a more credible figure, less interested in celebrity posturing and sticking to his ragged blues roots. Yet he was also an icon for the wrong reasons. By 1976, the guitarist once crowned the world's most elegantly wasted man was in reality an addict, ailing both physically and mentally. It's very interesting, you know, the emergence of Keith Richards, which I always trace to the 1969 Rolling Stones tour, you know, where Keith had, you know, the kind of haystack hairdo, you know, he became Keith, you know, and he emerged out of Jagger's shadow and really became a kind of second frontman in the band. Suddenly there were long interviews with Keith Richards and, you know, in Rolling Stone and in other magazines, and he became a counter-focus, you know, alongside Mick Jagger. And part of that was, you know, Keith as outlaw, Keith scoffing at drug laws and all this other kind of stuff. And it was fun, and it was exciting, and of course Keith is great and a great player, but then it really became, wait a second, this guy's a junkie and really is in trouble here. Like, it's not just a photograph anymore. You can only be elegantly wasted for so long before hard drugs robs you of your soul and your creativity and um, your, your muse. It will, it will destroy you in the end, you know. Hard drugs becomes a be all and end all in itself. It's just you are using in order to use. You're not using in order to sort of fuel the fire of creativity anymore. You're just using in order to somehow stay functioning and normal. Um, and so, you know, by 76, Keith is, is like a ghost, really, creatively. Yet in 1977, these problems would spiral out of control. Having already been charged with possession of cocaine in the UK and having lost his infant son, Tara, to respiratory failure at the end of the previous year, in February, Richards made world headlines. Arrested in Toronto with large quantities of cocaine and heroin, his passport was detained by the Canadian court and his movements restricted over the following eight months. With the very real threat that such a key component in their band may be jailed for years, the Stones were apparently stranded. They had to wake me up to a formally arrest me. And that took about two hours of dragging me out. Bam, bam. So I got like rosy cheeks and... Uh, oh, he's awake. You are under arrest. <laughs> oh, great. You know, I looked at the old lady and said, I'll see you in about seven years, babe. The implications of the Toronto bust were just enormous. First off, it threw into question the whole future of the band. I mean, the initial charges were not for possession, they were for trafficking, which, uh, as I understand it at the time, carried a mandatory prison sentence in Canada. So the likelihood was that he was going to go down. 
even if the charges were reduced to possession, would they be able to tour America, which was obviously the most lucrative market. So it's huge. The whole future of the band is, is in question. But also, you know, the questions it raises about Keith's state and was he actually in any fit condition to, to continue in the band. As it happens, um, he gets partially cleaned up because of the bust and uh, in a paradoxical kind of way, uh, the bust that threatens the disintegration of the stones may actually be the thing that enabled them to keep going. Apart from anything else, I think in, it was really the bust and the events in the wake of the bust that led to him and Anita Pallenberg breaking up. And I think it's highly probable that if Keith and Anita had stayed together, neither of them would still be alive. Happily, they both pulled through separately. Together, it might have been a very different story. With Keith unavailable during the majority of 77, the Stones were inactive, save for the release of their third live album, Love You Live, in September. Yet three months later, the band were able to begin sessions for a new album. And after years of recording in the UK and the US, work on this new material took place in EMI's Pathé Marconi Studios in Paris. Unlike their previous albums, the band called in few guest musicians to add to their sound. One exception was a young, relatively unknown harmonica player named Sugar Blue. I had been playing at a club called Le Vieil Gris and doing a lot of busking uh, in the metros and on the streets of Paris. There was a friend of theirs that I believe was working with Cubby Broccoli on a new Bond movie at the time. And he came to a party where I was playing at here at his jamming and he gave me a mixed number and said call okay so I thought that friends of mine were pulling my leg right what have I got to lose so I called I called the number and uh, I know Jagger's voice I mean you know from from interviews and things like that and I hear this really heavy cockney accent on the other side and I'm going okay somebody's pulling my leg. This is a joke and uh, what the heck, you know. So I just go along with it. He says, well, why don't you show up at um, um, uh, a studio, Studio Bois de Boulogne in, uh, in the Bois de Boulogne right outside of Paris. And I go, well, um, okay, what the heck, you know. <laughs> I figure, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm the butt end of a joke, but it's okay, I'll go for it. And I get out there, and um, lo and behold, it was Jagger, and he puts on this accent to sort of try and be uh, under the radar, you know, he doesn't want a lot of people to recognize him. Keith says, choose an amp, any amp. There are like 50 of them. <laughs> you know? And he says, that one over there, that one's, that one's mine. I said, okay, maybe that's got the right mojo. I'll try that one. And I did, actually, and it, and it sounded great. And we, um, we started playing. I mean, you know, we, I mean, we jumped right into it. it was, and uh, and uh, I mean, uh, we started playing, and I think we stopped playing about a good two or three hours later. You know, it was like, it was one, two, three, hit it, hit it, hit it, play, jam, have fun, you know? playing constantly for maybe, and I mean like constantly, for like 12, 18 hours a day for a year or more. Um, I had been practicing like a man possessed. And um, I was, and I had just come to Europe and uh, landed in uh, France and I had something to prove. And it was very important to me that the power and the dedication and the and and the belief in the music that I was playing should come through 
every note, every time I hit. And I think that I was so impassioned in my delivery, I think that maybe they heard that, you know, because I wanted to play in the tradition, but I wanted to add to the tradition, you know, like, uh, like Willie Dixon used to say, the most important thing that you can do as a blues man is to add to the, is to add to the canon of the blues. And I was working very, very hard on that. And I think that they heard my passion. As the Paris sessions spread into 1978, despite the strain of Richard's continued court proceedings, the Stones were going through a purple patch. With Jagger at the helm, penning a wealth of new material, the band recorded enough tracks to fill two or three albums, and after years of struggle, had seemingly rediscovered their passion and creative energy in the studio. I think Woody had a lot to do with bringing them back to that, to that raw and vital feel, you know, because Woody is very incendiary. I mean, he has a kind of personality that just glows and everything around him catches fire. There is something vital in his personality that is and, and about the way he plays that goes beyond technique, if you would. There is that which makes Ronnie Ronnie, his personality, imbues the stones with a vitality that they had been missing for a long time. I mean, uh, of course, uh, the Glimmer Twins, uh, Nick and Keith, are very, but, you know, they've been together, they know each other. It's, a, it's like an old marriage, you know? And uh, so fi it was kind of like, you know, one of the guests at the wedding 30 years ago <laughs> came and reminded them how much they loved each other. <laughs> you know, and that brought the music and the magic together. If Wood was key in revitalizing the band in the studio, it was Jagger who provided the album's creative drive. Like John Lennon before him, he had made New York his home base in 1976 and had been soaking up the city's extremes of squalor and decadence and its many flourishing artistic movements. New music in particular was thriving. Emanating from the seismic influence of Andy Warhol in the mid to late 60s, in the Lower East Side, the city had developed its own punk movement, which both predated and inspired its British counterpart. Whereas further north in Manhattan, Studio 54 had opened its doors in 77 to a heady mix of disco, celebrity and cocaine. The album Some Girls may have been recorded in Europe, but at its heart were the distinctive sounds and stories of New York City, all filtered through the mind of Mick Jagger. In the mid-70s, New York essentially was going bankrupt. And the city seemed out of control. You know, suddenly the whole graffiti thing was happening. So every time a train rolled into the station, it was just covered in graffiti. And there just seemed to be a sense of, you know, this town is turning into, um, you know, kind of jungle in a way. You know, there was a, a sense of uh, the streets being very raw. You know, every single union in the city went on strike for months for one reason or another. And, you know, finally there was, uh, you know, this, the economic problems that the city was having. You know, there was a famous New York Daily News cover about uh, President Gerald Ford saying, you know, Ford to city, drop dead. You know, it's just like, we're not going to rescue New York. And there was a sense of New York... Um, you know, in its own way, kind of teetering on the brink of uh, real collapse. As often happens, I mean, as New York was in that kind of danger, it kind of was going through a strange artistic flourishing. I mean, punk rock was happening, disco was happening, you know, the early stirrings of hip hop were happening. The energy of the city is coming from its kind of artistic community. And all of that is reflected in some girls, you know, walk in Central Park, creeping after dark, people think I'm crazy, you know? That sense of, you know, the danger of what New York is. And that's, you know, the great sort of thing about Jagger. I mean, as much as people say, you know, well, he's a socialite, you know, he's removed. When the Stones announced their 1975 tour, you know, they did it on a flatbed truck that went up Fifth Avenue. It got, a, again, a lot of attention to New York City. And if you look at Mick Jagger's outfit, he's wearing these jeans and his left pant leg is rolled up. 
That was a that's a bike messenger fashion, you know, so that your so that your pant leg didn't get caught in the chain of your bike, and you know, people were picking up on that like on the street, and there's Mick Jagger like picking up on it. It was not, you know, it wasn't something that people were doing at Studio Fifty Four, but it was just such a cool kind of gesture. That's the kind of New York I think that that Jagger presents. I think Some Girls, in many ways, is primarily Mick Jagger's record. And that's the vision of New York. You know, on the one hand, you know, am I hard enough? Am I tough enough? Am I rich enough? You know, in Beast of Burden. And at the same time, you know, the guy who's distraught and walking through Central Park in the middle of the night um, in Miss You, you know, you're getting both sides of, of, of what New York City is. Because Jagger, I think, felt comfortable moving in both those worlds. Do you ever go and see other bands? Oh, yeah. Like who? Who do you like? Well, I mean, when, most of the time in New York, I go around sort of clubbing, you know, a lot of nights of the week, Thursdays and Fridays. But, I mean, I just see every new band there is. I mean, lists and lists and lists. Some of them are not very good, but some of them are. Released in June 1978, Some Girls provided the shot in the arm that the Stones' career so desperately needed. Hailed by the music press as the band's strongest work since Exile on Main Street, it became their biggest selling studio album to date. After years of criticism for his lifestyle and questions over his commitment to music, Mick Jagger and his New York Odyssey had made the Stones relevant again. I see New York on the cover of Some Girls to start with. There's a sort of Warholian iconoclasm, taking some of those faces of celebrities and then doing something, you know, rather punkish with them. So straight away, that felt much more New York than London. There's this image, stereotypical image of Mick, who loves expensive cuisine, expensive girls. But I remember a quote from Ian Stewart, who basically said that Mick just organises everything. You know, Keith was out there, crashed out under the sofa quite a lot of the time. Mick really held it together, and he particularly held it together through some girls. This was a vital period when, you know, Keith had had his bust as well. And he really had his work cut out. I mean, to the point of getting Ronnie to teach him bits on the guitar as well. I mean, he actually, it was real hands-on kind of stuff. So I think that Jagger does have to take enormous credit for that throughout the whole, the band's whole career actually, but particularly this period where they were potentially quite vulnerable. And with Jagger at the helm, the first single from the album displayed a brazen disregard for the band's vulnerability and plunged them headfirst into disco. An underground musical phenomenon that had been seeping into the mainstream since the mid 70s, Jagger had been sampling the scene firsthand at Studio 54, where his wife Bianca had become the unofficial queen of the club. Although it had been dismissed out of hand as a musical fad by certain parts of the rock community, in 1977, the film Saturday Night Fever had become a nationwide sensation. A major part of its appeal were the hit songs contributed to the soundtrack by the Bee Gees, which marked the first successful fusion of disco and rock, and the Rolling Stones released Miss You, hot on the heels of these developments. The single became their first US number one since 1973's Angie. I remember when the bass line went disco, I was like, hmm, that's different, especially for the Stones. I'm like, I'm gonna play disco? Okay, that'll work. And um, when we hit the groove, I understood that um, they were trying to incorporate uh, the tradition with a new tradition, introducing blues harmonica into um, a disco groove. And, hey, I think it was a great idea, you know, because, I mean, I've, I've always been a fan of disco and I'm definitely a blues man. Well, hey, it, it, it's evident, you know, um, in hindsight that it was genius, you know, because it became the hit of 78. I mean, you know, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't go anywhere and not hear that song. Thank heaven for them, 
an excellent fusion of rock and disco. Disco was the first time since The Twist when every leading artist felt compelled or was compelled to record a song in that style. And so just as you had Frank Sinatra sing Everybody's Twistin', which is ridiculous, of course, he survived, people <laughs> moved on and went back to their regular lines of work, but everybody hit the reefs on disco. Elton John put out a disco 12-inch flop. Aretha Franklin disco record, nobody needed it. Uh, but the Stones put out Miss You. Part of the reason they got away with it is because Mick was always into the R&B rhythms and dance steps. And in that song, Miss You, he very cleverly used the falsetto that Barry Gibb had popularized. Jagger learned, I'm sure, from the Bee Gees. It's, it's incredible to think of Mick Jagger learning from the Bee Gees, but he saw how popular those records were. And, uh, and Miss You, he's great with his falsetto. Jagger with Miss You has two things which are from the first period of disco, one of which is song structure. Miss You is a coherent song. It's about something. And that's important. Um, he could take with him a lot of people who weren't dance fans just because it's a coherent song. And secondly is he has this uh, androgynous character, which he'd always had, but is particularly appropriate for disco in the late 70s. Disco really did spring out of the gay and Puerto Rican clubs, and it was a, a flamboyant music. Being a dance-based movement, it favored people who looked good and could move well. Well, this is something that Jagger had already done. He proved he could do this in the 60s. And he could be gay without scaring straight people. And the reason he could be gay without scaring straight people was because he was so sexualized, he covered more of the prism than your average person. And so he would naturally incorporate elements of this uh, into his uh, artistry and, um, and sound convincing doing it, which is very important, because you don't want to think he's a tourist. Uh, but even though he's sounding convincing, he's not at all disturbing. When I left Europe, I remember going back to uh, New York, and my little brother, who's like, you know, hardcore Harlemite kid, you know, from the hood, in the hood, all about the hood, and he was saying, Jimmy, because that's the name my mom called me, uh, gave me when I was uh, born, said, man, you got to hear this record by the Rolling Stones, man. He said, man, they got some bad harmonica play on there, man. You got to hear this, man. You're going to love this. <laughs> I was like, yeah, he's pretty good. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and, but when he told me this story, after I finished laughing and telling him it was me, it dawned on me how powerful a tune that this song was, that it even made inroads into the heart of the black community.
I don't know how anyone can not like Miss You. It's just one of the most incredibly vibrant pop singles of the 70s. Miss You was the first Stones masterpiece for a long time in the singles market, I think. Especially the 12 inch pink vinyl version, which just went on and on. And often those 12 inches were just awful. But this one, the riff was so good, that beautiful texture of the sugar blue, his harmonica, the guy they found in the streets of Paris. Jagger's vocals, and, Mick and uh, uh, Bill and Charlie right up front with the rhythm section. It was just such a warm, up-tempo, lively. This is the Stones not trying to be punk, keeping up with the punks. It was doing something different, and actually it won them more fans by doing that than trying to out-punk the punk bands, which would have been a bit silly, really. It was, it was a masterstroke. Yet there was a punk influence on some girls, albeit not from those British bands that had been laughing at the Stones' excesses two years beforehand. The New York punk scene, which was inspired by a more conceptual approach to art and music, had as its forebears Andy Warhol and the band he helped launch, The Velvet Underground. Having developed in the early 70s through acts such as the New York Dolls and Suicide, it emerged as a recognisable movement in 1974, when young bands began to appear at the Lower East Side Club, CBGB. By 77, figureheads Patti Smith, Television, The Ramones and Blondie had all become underground celebrities, poised for mainstream success. And it was this raw and streetwise world that Jagger and the Stones managed to channel with some girls. In America, much more so than in England, punk was an aesthetic movement. It wasn't particularly a political movement. And in America, it also was a kind of neoclassical movement. You know, I heard Richard Hell and the Voidoids cover Ventilator Blues by the Rolling Stones, for example. You know, Patti Smith worshipped the Rolling Stones, you know, looked like Keith Richards. So that sense of the Rolling Stones being the enemy was much more an English thing. It wasn't what was going on in New York. The Stones still had a kind of currency here. So they could tap into punk and they could tap into disco. On a track like Shattered, they can even tap into a little bit of hip hop, you know, and Jaguar sort of, you know, semi rapping on the track. And, you know, all of that was kind of credible, and all of that was, you know, part of the Stones world. <laughs> Insofar as Jagger was inspired by New York, what he was inspired was by Upper Crust New York. Did Mick ever go to CBGB? Is there any is there any record of his going to CBGB? I never heard about it. I think I would have. Now that doesn't mean that some girls doesn't in some kind of way reflect the punk, but he but it could have reflected it anywhere. I mean, all you had to do is listen to the records read the stories and say, hey, maybe I should do this. Now, maybe I should get a little rootsy again, or whatever he said to himself. Uh, rootsy would not have been the word. But uh, uh, get raw, right? Become more raw. And I think in that respect, Some Girls, which ha has its disco song, also has its punk feel. But I don't think that living in New York, in my opinion, was at all essential for that to happen. It was aesthetic, not cultural. It hasn't got the awkwardness of British punk. You know, it hasn't got the subway sec, the sort of almost hopping element of, of punk, but it's got this trad rock punk, which is more in keeping, I think, with what you heard in CBGB's and Max's Kansas City. Um, and it's got the energy. I mean, a, a wonderful raw kind of energy on most of the tracks on there. But it's a rock and rolling punk album as opposed to a sort of wooden peg-legged punk album that we would have got from, from London. Um, and the closest thing to it in Britain, I think, was The Clash's Give Them Enough Rope, which was trying to be American. 
with Sandy Perlman producing it. They were almost two of a kind, and The Clash were going one way, traitors to the punk cause, I think, and then you've got The Stones who are trying to meet, you know, meeting it in the middle, but, you know, by far the more acceptable album, I, I would say. Final track shattered, which there's no blue notes in there. I mean, that's the Stones really embracing not necessarily punk but new wave, talking heads, and bands like that, which are coming out of the, Amer of the New York clubs with a slightly different twist on things. You know, this isn't uh, Johnny Thunders, this is something with a bit more of an interesting sheen going on. So, glossy, there's a glossiness as well as you know, it was back to basics with the raw guitars up front. Um, there was this new wave sheen there that was very much flavour of, of the time and also what was going to happen over the next couple of years. For the most part, you know, punk and all of those New York bands, you know, the Patti Smith Group and Television and Richard Hell and the Voidoids and the Ramones even, you know, that was a kind of critical phenomenon in the United States. Those records really did not make much of a commercial impact till a little bit later. Even as they were chronicling a certain aspect of what New York was, that was appealing to people in New York, you know, who were moving in kind of those circles and going to CBGB and going to the Mud Club, to people in Iowa, you know, that was not registering. But, you know, with the Rolling Stones, you know, they were on the radio. You know, they were doing a big tour. You know, Some Girls was a big record, so their story of what was happening in New York got out there. And, uh, and it helped New York by the way. Uh, you know, that really, it, it certainly bolstered spirits here. And, uh, and, you know, it made New York seem really hip. And in keeping with this mutual love affair between Jagger and the city, at the close of 1978, the Stones were invited onto the fourth season of New York's hit comedy show, Saturday Night Live. Not only did they perform two tracks, but Mick also appeared alongside Dan Aykroyd in a parody of the Tom Snyder show. My guest tonight is a man who's familiar to anybody who owns a hi-fi set. <laughs> He's a member of the pop group, The Rolling Stones, and his name is Mr. Mick Jagger. <laughs> I just want to say that when, you, when they told me that you were doing the show, I was frankly quite apprehensive. You know, I'd heard you were a little bit of a cut-up, a kind of a hellion. I don't know what kind of hijinks to expect from guys like you, but here you are, you're a well-behaved young man, and frankly, sir, I am surprised. <laughs> Well, Tom, thank you. I really, that's nice of you. You know, before I came here, I heard a few things about you, and, and I, uh, I heard you were slow and a bit thick. You know, a, a, a kind of a dim bulb. <laughs> but now I've met you, you know, I, 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 I know you can't help it. Well, thank you very much, sir. You're welcome back anytime. We've uh, been talking about. Excuse me, Tom, one, one thing, you know, before we finish up this. Anything thing, at all, sir. Is it, through this entire interview, I, 
one thing has fascinated me. Yes, sir. It's the extraordinary variety of colors in your hair. I mean, there, there must be at least 12. I mean, there's gray and black and uh, blue and a little green. You must be aware of that. Green? I didn't know about the spot of green, now, Mick, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> Join us tomorrow on Tomorrow when we'll be talking with a group of beef farmers who claim that Elvis Presley's ghost is responsible for a mysterious series of aerial cattle mutilations in the Midwest. <laughs> Good night, everybody. With a hit record behind them and a major US tour underway, the band's return to relevance continued apace with the signing of reggae artist Peter Tosh to Rolling Stones Records. This label had never made any real effort to support or nourish other talent and instead served only the Stones and their side projects. Yet with Tosh, they made an exception. Previously a member of the legendary Wailers, he had been instrumental in introducing ex-bandmate Bob Marley to music, yet was a far more controversial figure. Released shortly after Some Girls, Tosh's first album for the label, Bush Doctor, featured contributions from Jagger and Richards, who were both keen to align themselves with such an edgy musical artist. I thought it was great when uh, the Stones signed Peter Tosh to their label. All of these monster bands at the time were starting their, their own labels, and, and my recollection is, by and large, they played pretty safe. I mean, Led Zeppelin started Swan Song, and who did they sign? The Pretty Things and Bad Company, you know. So the Stones are kind of not exactly going out on a limb, but they're being a lot more adventurous in signing someone like Peter Tosh. And uh, just the very fact of kind of raising their sights beyond the Anglo-American rock and roll tradition, I thought was great. Just your problems and no one else's problems you have. Tosh gave the Rolling Stones label a bit of edge because, uh, you know, I mean, Bob Marley was, was, was the middle-of-the-road moderate compared to Tosh. I mean, I, th I think uh, when they signed him, Jagger and Richards flew out to Jamaica to see him perform. I think it was probably the famous, uh, you know, peace concert with Manley and Siaga, the two Jamaican politicians. Um, you know, and there's Tosh on stage taunting the police and, and the politicians with a big spliff in his hand. And, uh, you know, I mean, he, he was almost the, uh, you know, the, the, the gangster figure in the, the, the harder they come. Legalize me. Don't criticize. Keith, we know, had a, and still has a genuine love for Jamaica, its people, and its music. I think Mick enjoyed the music and uh, also saw its kind of hip cachet as well. He then, of course, sang on, on the single from the first Tosh album on Rolling Stones Records. Um, Temptations number, keep on walking, don't look back. Well, I mean, it's a great choice of a song because um, in actual fact, the, the Wailers as a vocal trio in the 60s had kind of started out as a Jamaican copy of American soul vocal groups like The Temptations. I think Tosh may even have re recorded or at least sung the song, uh, you know, a decade earlier. It sounded like a good record. I mean, I thought Jagger did a pretty okay job on that, bearing in mind that only two years earlier, Cherry O' Baby you know, was a bit of a stubbed toe into the reggae water. 
It's strange. In 1972, they went down, uh, winter 72, they went down to Byron Lee's studio, Dynamic Sound Studios, for Goat's Head Soup. And it's weird because they came back from Kingston, Jamaica, without a great deal of reggae on that record. You know, they threw themselves right in the middle of it. And there wasn't really much reggae. But slowly it did seep its way through. Luxury on It's Only Rock and Roll. Jagger doing his patois star, star vocal as well. Cheerio Baby. And then Mick coming up with Tosh in 78, who was, you know, one of the great whalers, and ho just about holding his own on the record, I think. While Jagger was stepping out on Saturday Night Live to appear with Tosh, by the end of the year, both Keith Richards and Ronnie Wood were concentrating on side projects. In December 78, Richards' first solo single, the Chuck Berry cover, Run Rudolph Run, was issued. Evidence that the recovering guitarist was trying to focus on music to distract himself from the lure of heroin. It also showed that despite the Stones' recent attempts to modernise their sound, Richard's heart still lay in the blues and classic rock and roll. The following year, Ronnie Wood's solo LP, Gimme Some Neck, was released, and he formed the touring band The New Barbarians to support the album. As a result of the final judgement passed in Canada on Keith Richards, the guitarist was ordered to play a benefit concert for the National Institute for the Blind, and he joined the New Barbarians not only at that concert, but also on their US tour in late April 79, and at the Nebworth Fair in August. I was just looking for something to do. What can I, what do I do best? I know, I play guitar in a rock and roll band, you know, so where's the nearest one? Ronnie's. <laughs> and Ronnie's always there when you need him, quite usually inadvertently, right? but it's, uh, it's that usual mystical timing, you know. He had this thing going, and I said, oh, sure, man, I'll come. Yeah. So I just did it. is a kind of traditional musician who likes to be out there playing. And this thing with the Stones, you know, maybe we'll go out in three years, you know, maybe we'll go out in five years. You know, I think that was really beginning to take its toll on him. He wasn't doing very well, by the way, with those long periods of inactivity. And so I think, you know, latching onto Ron Wood and pulling the new barbarians together and, and getting out on the road, you know, was one way to try to deal with that. Um, but in many ways, it, it suggested, uh, it was suggestive of, of some of the issues that were going on within the band itself. I would assume that by the late 70s, Mix being in Manhattan with Bianca at Studio 54 was troubling to Keith. I think it didn't make him like this guy anymore. And, you know, mates like that, they often have their problems. I mean, the fact that they've been able to stay together in any form is remarkable, and it's and we're not talking about Sam and Dave or the Everly Brothers here. You know, it's not like they they're at each other's throats and just completely faking it when they get on the stage. It's that they have their differences and their distance, but they're still bandmates and happy to do that. Uh, and so, uh, I would assume that Keith very much is feeling the need for all kinds of outlets. I mean. There is also the fact, of course, that he's a junkie and Mick isn't, and junkies actually like to hang out with other addicts. Addicts really like other addicts. So that would probably be another thing, and not so kind to Keith in that particular case. Yeah, to a certain Keith has never, Keith has always been amazingly unpretentious. I give him that every time. And his solo albums are actually somewhat better than Mick's, albeit not quite as good as his fans say they are. Um, but, uh, 
he definitely had to have some serious misgivings about Mick's lifestyle. It just is not the way he wanted to live. And so sure, he sought outlets. He always has. He's been doing it for a long time. And those outlets were able to distract Richards from the tensions at the heart of his relationship with Jagger. Unable to contribute strongly to the Stones' direction over the previous few years, in 1979, a recovering Richards was looking to become a more active participant in the production of their latest offering, Emotional Rescue. Yet he found he was out of kilter with Jagger's pursuit of the latest trends, and their strained partnership was evident on the resultant album. Released in June 1980, it was a commercial success, yet disappointed many listeners. I don't think that there is any question that when you know Keith really began, certainly with his arrest in in Toronto and the prospect of his possibly going to jail, you know his his drug problems, you know being a drug addict. I think there's no question that Mick Jagger decided, you know, either I take the reins here or this band falls apart. I think that's what a lot of what people uh, forget in terms of you know seeing Jagger. Oh, he's a control freak or whatever. It's like if this band was going to get from Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday to Thursday, somebody had to be behind the wheel. And, you know, Jagger just decided, all right, I'll get behind the wheel. Around the time of Emotional Rescue, Keith is trying to, well, okay, I'm back, you know, I'm relatively clean, let's get moving. It's like, well, you know, where have you been for the last six years? But if you listen to it now, I mean, Emotional Rescue, you know, you could find things that are kind of interesting about it. It's it, in many ways so forgettable. You know, there's an element of, um, I mean, not even going through the motions. <laughs> it just doesn't quite rise to the level of going through the motions. You know, there's a kind of, you know, just sense of a complete absence of ideas. You know, it's like, yeah, the Rolling Stones, step up a little bit here. <laughs> After Miss You, which had just roared out of the speakers and onto the dance floor, Emotional Rescue was just a much more muted, you know, dance floor song, and it just didn't have that sense of occasion or element of surprise even. They were treading water, I think, already by this stage. Yes, you could be mine. Emotional Rescue is a real amber warning light because it is forgettable. Outside of the title song, which is a huge hit, uh, it's not really worth talking about because everything that's done well is something they've already done well. It sounds like a, a mess, you know, it was some girls part two but, but weaker in almost every way. There's a track called Summer Romance, which was almost like a parody of Respect, or a bad version of Respectable. There was Where the Boys Go, which was like a, a poor man's members, which really isn't saying too much. It was all over the place. It was a bit odds and sods. Right down, and the, even the cover was lukewarm. Everything about it was lukewarm. Um, and after some girls, it was very disappointing. Interestingly enough, when they promoted that album, Jagger said something like, there's no future left in rock and roll. And you know, when you're listening to that record, you think, he's got that one right. I'm so I'm so emotional rescue the stones really are struggling i mean the material is weak she's so cold is possibly the most tepid single they've ever released 
I mean, my recollection when, when the album came out, in fact, throughout this, this sort of period of the Stones, is that uh, people fell into two camps, really. There were those who were willing the Stones to make another great album, and so were over-eager with every new release to, to claim uh, some kind of return to form. And there were those who'd already written the stones off and uh, just used each new release as further evidence to their argument, belief that, that the band were already a busted flush. Truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. <laughs> You know, after some girls, Emotional Rescue just sort of feels so, just like half-assed and unconvincing. It doesn't feel like Keith was fully present for the record. I mean, he has said that All About You was sort of the only thing that he could really put his name to or lay credit to, that he did that separately, Mick was not involved with it. It's the only really decent song on the record for me. It's the beginning of those great Keith songs that often finish Stone's albums. There's a sort of run of them, and they're, I just think they're great. It's the soulful Keith Richards. It's the Keith who still feels music in a way that Mick apparently doesn't anymore. You know, Mick just tosses things off in a rather glib way, whether he's doing a kind of hard rocker, whether he's doing the cod reggae thing on Send It To Me, whether he's um, singing Where The Boys Go, or whether he's doing the kind of funk thing. It just feels like Mick putting on this hat now and then he'll put on that hat and it's just so insincere. Yeah. Lester Bang said that Black and Blue was the first Stones album that was officially meaningless, but I don't think it is meaningless compared to this. This is the first record where you just feel it is pure contractual obligation, with the exception of All About You. After the return to form of Some Girls and the revitalising of the band's energy through Ron Wood, by 1981, the Stones were in trouble. While holding sessions for another album, a number of band meetings took place across May and June in New York City regarding their future. Richards, on holiday with his new partner, Patty Hansen, failed to show up at the majority of these, and midway through discussions, Charlie Watts declared that the band was finished. At the heart of the issue were the conflicting interests of Mick and Keith, and these would eventually engulf the entire band. The great feud between Jagger and Richards ought to be something that only they can tell you what went on. However, it was fought out in public in almost every interview from the Times, so we can draw some pretty accurate uh, conclusions about, about what was happening. I mean, it seems that Jagger has some difficulty dealing with, with a functional Keith again. Allegedly, Jagger at one point turns around and says to somebody, I wish he'd just go back to being a junkie again because he was much less trouble then. So that's the roots of it. Um, it then gets as exacerbated by a whole number of, of issues, both musical, personal and, and social as, 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 as well, really. Musically, Keith has this view, which I have some sympathy for, that Jagger is by this point chasing trends and he believes that the Stones always set trends and if they're no longer setting trends they should just at least continue in the trend that they, they set way back when rather than you know chasing every kind of ephemeral, ephemeral fad of, of pop fashion. Socially he's pretty much out of sympathy with the world that Jagger is now 
moving in. At this point, there are two worlds. There's the Stone's world and there's Mick's world. And, and he feels very alienated from that uh, kind of high society thing. Mick, to try to be fair to him and see it from his point of view, he's running the Rolling Stones as this multi-million pound corporation with this vast number of em employees and so on and so forth. And uh, Keith's turning up to meetings and sort of sitting there flicking his ratchet knife and, uh, as I say, the bottle of vodka in the other hand. So, so you've got this partnership that has endured so well and made the Rolling Stones what it is. And it's reached the point where one half of the partnership is sitting there with its sort of appointments diary in one hand and its calculator in the other. And the other one's got a bottle of vodka and a, a switchblade. Yet amidst this breakdown, the band managed to bounce back from the disappointment of emotional rescue. Back in September 1980, producer Chris Kimsey had delved into the archives to listen to rejected or half-completed songs from Goat's Head Soup onwards, and it showed his discoveries to the band. With a US tour plan for late 1981, the band, and Jagger in particular, had spent time adding elements to these tracks and formed an original album to promote their live shows. On its release in 1981, Tattoo U's mixture of styles and sounds attracted glowing reviews and strong sales. Its lead single, a track originally recorded as a reggae number, with a crucial take done in the band's inimitable late 60s style, was key to the album's success, Start Me Up. When Start Me Up came out, there was general rejoicing. This is the Rolling Stones. It was the first classic Keith intro in years. I mean, you want to hear that intro again and again and again. Start Me Up is top five, top ten in their entire output. And not as well as, of course, the theme song of what they have been for 30 years. It, and it's, I mean, it's such a great song. To me, that's the difference between Mick and Keith. Mick is actually the person with the conceptual grasp. You want to know how smart he is? He was smart enough to decide that they should do a classic Stones track and it should say this at this time and that there was a reason it didn't work as a reggae track. I think we're very lucky they didn't, obviously very lucky they didn't do it as a reggae track. Uh, yeah, because then it's just a song about sex or something. Now it's a song about their lives. Uh, and, 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 uh, and that's typical of what Mick is like at his best. Is he always at his best? No, of course not. Nobody's always at their best. But right there, that's, that's why Mick is a great rock and roll artist. There's a lot of terrific things about, you know, Tattoo You. I mean, I think that Chris Kimsey went and found all this stuff, you know, but you know, the Stones still worked on those tracks. I mean, Mick Jagger has said, look, you know, yeah, there were things that we had worked on, but the reason they didn't get on records is a lot of them weren't finished. You know, I had to write melodies, I had to write lyrics, you know, how to do new vocals. You know, obviously, um, these things were not just uh, things that were, you know, pulled wholly formed from the vaults. Tattoo You had to be put together pretty quickly. You know, the Stones had decided they were going to go on tour. Having things that they had worked on, like sort of presented to them, precluded the process of them trying too hard. Again, which I always think is the thing that sinks them when they sink. It's not too fancy, and it's not trying too hard, and it's not just kind of looking around and figuring out, you know, gee, what's happening this minute, and let's try to emulate it. 
it's as if, you know, you were kind of skimming the top off the period. I mean, even as, you know, the 70s, you know, was not necessarily the Stones' high point. You know, if you skim the two or three best tracks on all those records, uh, you know, you have a pretty good collection of stuff. And, you know, in a certain way, that's what Tattoo You became. Waiting for a friend, uh, very easy to interpret it in the light of the Jagger Richards feud. And I think um, they actually play upon that in the video for it, which I think Michael Lindsay Hogg shot. Um, I mean, the song itself goes all the way back to uh, Goat's Head Soup. I don't know what portion or to what extent the lyrics date back to that album, but the, the, the music certainly does. But I mean, it, you know, it's clear from the video that, that Mick and Keith were aware of the implications that could be read into, into this song. And, you know, sure, that gives it uh, an extra frisson. It's strange, this is an album made up of old tracks. And then I think Jagger writes some new lyrics and obviously does the vocals and so on and so forth. Um, but the end result is a superior album to those for which this material was originally written. If the Stones album was widely praised, their mammoth US tour and the 1982 European tour divided audiences. For some, these record-breaking shows were the group's best in years, playing colossal arenas and confirming their position as the world's greatest rock and roll band. For others, it was the end point of the Stones' move from musicians to entertainers, the culmination of every shallow and questionable aspect of the group that the punks had criticised only five years beforehand. There was a sense of the band having more confidence on stage. I mean, it was not as good, I don't think, a show as they would later do. I mean, and, you know, Keith, when he was battling with Mick later, you know, very famously said, you know, we don't need the lemon yellow tights and we don't need the cherry picker. You know, talking about the Rolling Stones, you know, Jagger going up on this cherry picker and wearing this kind of odd football outfit, American football, you know, with these <laughs> lemon yellow tights and a, and a kind of jersey with a number on it. That said, I mean, I think the Stones sounded better, you know, and I think they had gotten used to now being in on these large stages. I think Ron Wood was a more integrated part of the band on stage you know, for those shows. They would not go out on the road again for eight years, by the way. I mean, and, you know, so, I mean, the issues that were just in the horizon for them uh, were, you know, were, they were just kind of looming. But, you know, at that point, I think everybody was excited to have them out there and they were doing a pretty good job of it. When I went to see the Stones in 82, you know, they did the America tour in 81 and 82, I saw them at Wembley, it was just the most wretched thing, you know, it was just musically horrible. And it was just all about Jagger wearing these utterly bizarre and grotesque sort of, like sports leotards with, with kind of elbow pads and God knows what he was thinking, but running up and down these endless runaways. I mean, Charlie Watts said that, you know, 
uh, that time. You know, he wouldn't see Jagger for five minutes. How can you play like He couldn't even see his lead singer. It really was so depressing, and the band was so on together, and everything was played slightly too fast, and just nothing had any coherence to it. And so, even though I thought Start Me Up was okay, and Waiting on a Friend was okay, you know, I, I just really gave up on the Stones at that point. I really did, I just gave up on them. The band's final show of the European tour in July 1982 would be their last bona fide concert for seven years. Just as some fans were now tiring of the Stones' metamorphosis into a corporate machine, internally tensions had continued to grow. Yet despite their differences, in November they did return to Paris to begin work on new material. Almost a year later, the first single from these sessions emerged, Under Cover of the Night. Often still accused of working on autopilot, Jagger again proved that he was taking music seriously and provided his first political lyrics since the late 60s, this time focusing on the US-backed right-wing regimes and death squads in Central and South America. Yet despite the controversial subject matter, it was only a moderate success. It's not so much a return to uh, Jagger writing about politics, because he hardly ever wrote about politics. You know, the, the street fighting man stands out and, and, and sympathy for, for the devil, perhaps to a lesser extent. Um, but it's, it's, it's virtually new territory for him. He's clearly aroused by what is going on in Central and Southern America and how it's become uh, a new theatre for the Cold War to be played out and in particular for the, the kind of duplicity and hypocrisy of, 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 of what the Americans are, are, are doing there. Uh, and I think it's a tremendously brave track. One of the things that Jagger is, is doing on this album is telling stories. You know? I mean, there's another song about this horrendous story uh, from Paris about this Japanese guy who, who kills and, and eats his girlfriend. Uh, and that is, you know, this, this kind of newspaper story style of writing. But on, on the track Undercover, he's, he's clearly doing something else, you know. Uh, it's not a newspaper report of what's going on. He's taking sides in there. You know, there are lines there about these dirty little G.I. Joes and so on and so forth. Um, so it, it was a brave song to write. Undercover of the Night is fabulous. And it certainly keeps Keith fans happy. Some great work by Keith on that. But also Mick wrote a very serious song. So certainly at that time, uh, Ronald Reagan's support for some of the right-wing death squads in Latin America was controversial. And Jagger talks about it. It, it was a high-quality song, but it wasn't r remotely lyrically commercial. Who wants to hear about a controversial part of a popular president's foreign policy? It's the first time the Stones have really felt not just older, but old. And, and they, uh, it's unfortunate it should have happened to them on a good record. <laughs> but that was the year 
when all of these groups of the second British invasion happened at the same time. Wham! with George Michael and Andrew Ridgely, Spandau Ballet, Duran Duran, Culture Club with Boy George. Uh, and, and they, and so suddenly, uh, the Rolling Stones are clearly for adults, not for young people. Released in November 1983, into this new marketplace dominated by a fresh generation of mainstream acts, the album Undercover failed to ignite the charts. Reaching only number four in the US, it broke a streak of eight consecutive number one studio albums. And even in that less progressive marketplace, the band finally seemed to be losing their commercial hold. In the modern musical climate, the Stones seemed decidedly old hat. Later Rolling Stones records like Undercover, I mean, the issue finally becomes production. Some of the production trends of the 1980s in particular are very identifiable, you know, to this day. I mean, if you listen to a Hall & Oates record from back then, you know, Hall & Oates made a lot of great songs, but, you know, to hear them now, you're just kind of going, you know, it, it bothers you, you know, it's just you're trying too hard. You know, there was a concern about getting on the radio. There was a sense of, you know, MTV coming along and, and altering the landscape in that way. And, you know, how are we relevant now to this new generation? And, you know, the Stones are at their best, I think, when they trust themselves and don't worry about that stuff too much, you know. And um, I think you can hear them uh, on Undercover, on that album in particular, worrying about that stuff. Undercover was a mixing desk album. It wasn't a Mick and Keith album. It was a mixing desk album. It really did seem like old people playing with young people's toys. And they were clueless. I don't think they particularly liked the new music, but they felt this is all they can do. They're all the Bowies, the Jaggers, the Neil Youngs, the Dillons. They couldn't really do much else. They had to keep relevant in some ways. Um, and you can sense that they don't really like what they're doing, I don't think. And I just get the sense that they're not in the studio. They're just handing it over to a bank of engineers who will then do, we'll make it modern for you. It was really that. It felt that cynical. It sounded that cynical. And I'm pretty sure it was that cynical. Still trying to compete with modern acts, in this case, artists like Michael Jackson and Prince, with the singles for this album, the Stones bravely entered the new world of MTV. Yet their appeal to a younger audience was limited, and the follow-up to Undercover of the Night, She Was Hot, failed to hit the top 40 on either side of the Atlantic. This Hot becomes the first single not to make the top 40, which I suspect caused Jagger some soul searching. The Stones are now moving away from that youth market. It's very difficult for teenagers to, the singles buying public, to relate to these guys who are now, you know, what, 40 years old. Um, in the same way that when the Stones and the Beatles appeared in the early 60s, um, the people who bought their records weren't listening to Elvis Presley and Jerry Lee Lewis and Chuck Berry. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I remember as a kid in the 1960s and, and 
I thought people like Chuck Berry and Jerry Lee Lewis were, you know, as old as my grandparents. Uh, they weren't, of course. You know, you look back and you realise they were only in their mid-30s, probably. Uh, so very hard for a, a kind of single-buying teenage market to, to relate to these, these old guys in their, in their 40s. Jagger, of course, still wants to relate to all these young girls on the dance floor, and that's probably why he moves off in the direction of the solo career and she's the boss and uh, he's trying to reinvent the young Lothario figure and possibly he realises he's not going to be able to make that reinvention at this point in the context of the band. Yet that reinvention would be impossible in any context. Despite signing a four-album deal with CBS in 1983 for a record $28 million, like many of the other iconic acts of the 1960s, for the Stones, the 1980s was a nightmare decade. With the internal battles between Jagger and Richards escalating, the greatest rock and roll band in the world fell apart at the seams. It's catastrophic. Mick tries to reinvent himself as a solo artist and shed the baggage of the Stones, which of course he can't do. Uh, Keith's problems are, are very well documented. Uh, Bill Wyman goes completely off the rails chasing a 13-year-old girl who he ends up marrying. I think she's probably 16 by the time of the nuptials, but it all started when she was 13 and he's, you know, 45 or whatever. And dear old Charlie Watts, who has uh, never had anything to do with the, the drug side of the Rolling Stones, suddenly in middle age decides to become a heroin addict. So just a... Horrible period for them. Ronnie Wood is in and out of rehab, um, and it really couldn't couldn't have been couldn't have been worse. Fortunately, they survive it and uh, come out the other side. Probably no longer able to make great records, and that's where they reinvent themselves as the greatest live rock and roll band in the world, um, just playing the old hits. <laughs> Actually, there was life after Undercover. It certainly was not the end. It was not the end. There were, there were, there were things that lay up ahead um, that, um, that, were, that showed that there was still something. <laughs> if they could be, if they, when they were bothered to sit down and work hard and, uh, uh, and uh, re, re establish contact with their muse, they could still pull something out of a hat. Yet the period of activity between 1975 and 1983 remains their last significant era as a recording act. Despite criticisms that they were both chasing trends and treading water, they nevertheless experimented, found fresh sources of inspiration and succeeded in producing lasting music that will continue to be discovered by new generations of fans. I think in terms of how good the music is, they were dealing with impossibly inflated expectations that nobody could have fulfilled, and that, in retrospect, their craft um, got them through, as did their willingness to experiment, which happens even on Black and Blue, even if the experiment was forced on them. The level of craft means that they produce a more than respectable body of songs and enduring music. So I think that this, that this output, dismissed though it is, is a pretty impressive testament to how good they are. I think it's fair to say that you know Some Girls and Tattoo You were probably the last two Rolling Stones albums that really kind of you know fully address the moment, you know, are important records that are about that time and also you know find the Rolling Stones kind of driving some of the things that are going on rather than 
sort of chasing them. Past that point, it seems as almost as if the Rolling Stones kind of live in their own universe. You know, they make a record, you know, whatever, three or five years. You know, there's almost always good things on those records. Are those records that shape that time, define it? Not really. But, you know, are they quality, listenable albums? For the most part, they are. You know, the Stones as a live band, to me, still are terrifically exciting in a funny way. That is a kind of relevance. But, you know, as far as, you know, the songs, you know, a track like Start Me Up, a track like Miss You, that really seems to both be timeless and so much of its time. You know, the Stones have not been able to do that really since then.